it seemed like a lot of really interesting conversations, which I think speaks to the power of the two papers that we have heard already. Okay, so our third speaker this afternoon is David Marriott. David is a Charles T. Winship Professor of Philosophy at Emory University. His research expertise is in comparative Francophone Caribbean literature, in literary theory, psychoanalysis, black cultural theory and philosophies of race, literary and visual cultures of modernism. He is the author of multiple books, including On Black Men from 2000, Wither Fanon, Studies in the Blackness of Being from 2018, Lacan Noir, Lacan in Black Studies in 2020, and most recently, Of Effacement, Blackness and Non-Being, which was last year, right? Yeah. yeah. In addition to this academic work, Professor Marriott is also a poet. He has published eight books of poetry, and in this capacity, he has been a Stanford Humanities Center fellow, working on black poetry and knowledge, and also the Leverhulm Visiting Professor of Critical Poetics at the University of Sussex. David. Thank you, Elizabeth and my fellow panelists and everybody assembled here for making this hopefully a more legible event than I first thought it would be. Um, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, this project is uh, new, it's uh, long, hence I'm gonna excerpt uh, something from it. But it is, funnily enough, in tandem or in conversation with some of the things which have already been evoked by our two um, speakers um, earlier. So the question, what I'm gonna talk about, I'm not gonna talk about Lacan actually, so it's a bit of a outlier. I'm gonna talk about um, the question of the object um, and uh, object as relation. So, um, this is a way of approaching kind of from the obliquely the question of how gender and sexuality often get reduced to questions of object choice. Now obviously there's been a lot of pushback including the panelists today in terms of what the object is, what it stands in for, its symptomatic structure, all the rest of it. But the question of choice is for me the more formidable problem, object choice. So I'm gonna talk about that in relation to what I consider to be the most powerful group of theorists or thinkers who think about the object, and they are, tend to be a group of British um, psychoanalysts. The first one of which is Wilfred Bion, or Bion. And uh, one of the things that he introduces is a nothing, a no hyphen thing, that precedes our capacity to feel or think it. In the same way, he asks, what if, quote, thinking is a function forced upon the psyche by the pressure of thoughts, unquote. A pressure directed not towards reality, but to thoughts that necessarily exceed our capacity to think them. Such an idea seems to reverse the usual, usual relations between cogito and ergo sum. But consider, if we follow Bion, whose formula this is, thought is always a disturbance, a crisis of legibility to thinking, a force or pressure that precedes our capacity to think it, which we can choose to either evade or modify. Uh, too much pressure can lead to a breakdown in thought or the capacity for thought, which leads to an impasse in thinking itself. If that pressure cannot be sustained, it cannot be conveyed or represented. But if there is no pressure, there can be no thought. 
there would be no separation of cogito from ergo sum and no crisis of illegibility to be conceived without this divide between what we say and what we do not know in saying it. In whatever way it, the incomprehensible, the unknowable, the impossible, is communicated to us, i.e. as some rather than say ergo cogito. So one of the claims I'm going to make is that in object relations, blackness is both an example of that which cannot be said, symbolized, represented, but it's also something which object relations, or I would say British object relations, cannot think. So that's the, that's the narrative I'm gonna give, and hopefully I can prove it. So my first axiom, and I'm just gonna give you an axiom and a proof, and then I'm gonna shut up. The axiom is as follows. The word representing blackness as thought is not the same as the identical word when it is representing its illegibility. So this is the proof. And I'm going to turn to another formidable thinker of the object in its relations. One of the most interesting things about the pill and the moon, a 1969 talk given by Donald Winnicott, is how thought, when it is disturbed or damaged, assimilates what he calls blackness to the murderous work of unconscious fantasy. Fantasy with a PH. Winnicott's illustration of the point includes a 16-year-old English girl who was, quote, born with a cord around my neck, unquote, which affected her mental capacity, but whom he says needs to be on the pill, the contraceptive pill, because she has met, quote, a very black African, unquote, to whom Winnicott tells us the idea of having sex with him was, quote, very exciting for her, unquote. The word very leaves vague what can only be defined as an exquisite implication, namely of an excitement engorged by its own, what he calls expression, to the extent that the word having, and these are all quotes, to have a black man having the pill, unquote, expresses, quote, what she hasn't got, unquote, and what frantically, terribly, quote, she couldn't deal with, unquote, rather than something she could. His second example, I mean, this is a strange paper. His second example is that of a dream of what he calls a most beautiful white object, unquote, which is the head of a child and which leads him to say, and again, this is another quote, and in the dream before I woke, I said, this has nothing to do with the Negro problem of black and white. It goes right behind it. It has to do with the black and white that is in the individual human being. And there it was, unquote. So my first question in relation to, to these two examples is there what was? Is that which hides the Negro the same as what reveals it? Is the drive to kill Winnicott's words, beautiful white babies through this desire for the very black, and remember this is a paper about the contraceptive pill, or what emerges from it? And is this drive to kill a problem then of blindness, something being hidden by something else, or is the problem one of what he calls an acute crisis that produces what he calls an exaggerated excitement in the woman who would assume responsibility for what the word very exposes? It is, however, equally odd and fascinating 
to discover why the desire to have sex with a very black man should indicate an incapacity to, quote, contain, to hold, to tolerate things, unquote. First, because this suggests, quote, a lack of depth in her inner reality, unquote. Second, because there's clearly a racial element to the uh, words, squiggles, the representations that reveal that incapacity, and a way of remarking on what he calls her drawings, in which we see her draw in the therapy. There's a cord around that child, there's a rope around that person's neck, unquote. Given these squiggles, and again, I use that word advisedly, some of you have read Winnicott will know that's um, a title of one of his most important books, which also deals with a repressed element of blackness. Um, but what I'm saying is all of these figures, these tropes, and uh, maybe we can come back to this use of the word trope, because that is part of this debate going on in this panel between analogy, catechesis, other forms. Um, is this trope? these tropes, this incapacity to contain, to hold, to tolerate things, a way in which object relation theory is able to move away from the discussion of what is being discussed here, anti-black murder, to that of motherhood and contraception. And um, what I'm trying to get you to think about is the way in which the theory itself of object in its relations is acting out a kind of displacement of blackness, which is itself being hidden by the form of Winnicott's words. Let me just illustrate this point because it's kind of subtle. So to return to the point made earlier, the word black differs significantly, it seems, for someone able to go behind its meaning and for someone who can only dream, this is the English girl, of its hallucinatory possession. At this point, it is hard to tell whether the desire to have the very black leads to death or imagination, true thought or mindless annihilation, or why the thought of it should culminate strangely in such an odd assortment of tropes. But it is also unclear to me what the word tolerate is being used as evidence for. For existence or its degraded collapse into non-existence, say. And again, I give you another citation. He was a very black African, which didn't seem to make any difference in their family, unquote. But what difference is being attended to here? The suspicion that is more or less hidden behind that didn't seem, or its lack thereof. But the question of what difference makes or does not seems to end up as a question of birth, as a right to white lucidity, as the obligation or duty to come to the right white decision to choose the beautiful white over the very black, to, or to judge or know it truly, deeply, thoughtfully, beyond the inadequacy of what Winnicott calls our black-white illusions. A naivety, he claims, whose logic has nothing to do with being, life, thought, or to use Lee's phrase, reproductive futurity. So I want to move on again to a second kind of angle in this reading of Winnicott. This is a second axiom I'd like to um, present and then I'll give you another proof. This axiom suggests blackness gives rise not to toleration, but to the sexualized limits of the tolerable. Again, allow me to illustrate what I'm trying to get at here. The most curious um, feature of the shift in conflict between the desire for the very black and the desire not to have a beautifully white 
child is that it should take place at all. And this is what Winnicott says, we have got to tolerate the contradictions, unquote, he tells us. We have, quote, got to tolerate the tensions that have got to be carried around with us about make us doubtful about everything and that makes us value doubt, unquote. If we are not able to tolerate doubt, the implication is we risk reducing thought to what he calls a paranoic fear of destruction, of hatred, of intolerance. Evidently, what is to be remembered here is that it is very difficult to tolerate uncertainty. Hence the need for the pill, I simply must have it, in order to contain the very black or its unconscious fantasy. No one is more intolerant of unconscious fantasy than the general public, Winnicott tells us. The problem, however, is why that intolerance should lead to, quote, murder. Before hate, in a sense, object relating involves destruction. That is, again, from the same essay. Before hate, in a sense, object relating involves destruction. Anti-black hatred is no easier than, perhaps no different from, discovering our inability to tolerate destruction. That is, our inability to cope with acute crises of legibility and illegibility. But that eventuality means that blackness is also intolerable and at a primal level before um, we even meet the question of social hatred. The explicit and uh, deeply pervasive idea that blackness cannot be posited to mean life seems to present a radical disjunction between blackness and being, as well as blackness and the two functions of mental life, namely reparation and destruction. If neither is possible without the other, neither is reducible to the other. Even the plea for tolerance that Winnicott's assertions of doubt allow founds no support within the anti-black fantasies of his text in all of its most destructive ambivalence. Thinking, as it is fought in the pill and the moon, you could say is anti-black. It murders it as non-relation or irrelation, as anti-life and a logos. Okay, that's a strong claim. Allow me to uh, back it up. So Winnicott can no more distinguish between white desire and anti-black destructiveness than he can come up with a definition of a legitimately white desire to have a black child. The thought that could tolerate such acceptance cannot itself be tolerated or upheld. Accordingly, the white desire for murder, which he attributes to a 16-year-old girl, must itself be murdered as a black object relation. And since a dream of the beautiful white cannot exist without murdering the very black, we must ask what it is that gives tolerance such a terrible intolerance as a relation. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Um, let us say in psychoanalysis, and I'm only talking about kind of object relations theory here, it is our capacity to tolerate the frustration of the nothing, or what Bion calls the no mother, the no mother, again hyphenated, that signifies our ability to suffer loss or absence. The no mother or nothing is not only central to this account of thought, psychoanalysis account of thought, but of all thought of relation 
which rests on mothering, mothering. The no mother stroke no thing is what allows us to think what is beyond thought. She thinks the ineffable and is the ineffable of thought. And again, I'm just extrapolating from what Winnie Cott's essay is saying here. So in that sense, the no mother stroke no thing prolongs and goes beyond the impossible, the incomprehensible, the unknowable. She, or I'm, I'm only using this gender term because um, I could also use the word it or whatever, but for conventional purposes, I'll just use the word she. She allows us to know and express the nuff, the nuff thing, the no thing, the pressure it exerts on thought, to know what is re irreducible to thought, the thought that precedes the understanding and thus what is fundamentally, absolutely unthought. Okay. I think that's the formula, um, which is being shared by both Winnicott and Beyond. I think that's beyond dispute. But what the formula also shows, I would like to argue, is why the frustration qua the no thing as a telos and origin of thought precedes what I'm here calling a white capacity to think it. The formula also does not allow us to account for why the difference between the no mother and the no thing as a source and limit of frustration itself relates or seems to rely upon an anti-black knowledge or exclusion or repression or foreclosure. Choose your adjective word. I think the formula is also equally unhelpful in explaining why this utterly random drive to think and so express thought must be connected to a no mother's nothing's ability to tolerate and so contain the fears and conflicts of particular thoughts that, insofar as they reflect the power of the mind to ensnare and delude itself, are the very thoughts that also threaten to connect us with the thoughts of others that we both fear and resist. Now, I'm arguing that these kinds of structures, these paranoid structures about violation, purosity, um, opening, precede the very notion of an object, and therefore precede telos of both gender and sexuality. This is what I think psychoanalysis allows us to think um, in ways which I think um, are profound and um, challenging. So once again, we are dealing with an encounter between what must but cannot be said and the inadequacy of any symbolization to pertain to what necessarily must be said as an is not. We are not then dealing, I'm going back to the question earlier, we're not dealing with negation. This is not. Um, this is not my mother, which is Freud's famous example from 1925, paper on negation. What we're dealing with is the less familiar idiom of what I would call a ne pas. I mean, I'm sure other people have other words for it. And uh, that, that, in some ways, the mind would rather pair off with an impossibility of signification. And so take refuge in a not or a no thing whose discovery can only ever be partly known in language. And at this point, I agree with what was said earlier uh, by um, Salem Witt and uh, Lee. But what I'm also adding um, to the mix, if you like, or to this debate we're having a discussion, is that you cannot name blackness if it is a napar, or represent it or aim at it as if you were aiming at an object. 
for it excludes being, which to represent no thing, and even the unthought implies. Still. So, again, these are strong claims, and I'm going to try and back them up. The nothing, or the nepa, and again, the blackness of this thought, which precedes thinking, does not engender a conception in the sense of a cognition. It does not involve what Bion calls true thought, in which ego cogito is transmuted into knowledge. A nepa marks a place of anti-crisis or non-legibility and a fundamental unknowing which appears, as it were, between parentheses or quotation marks. And now, again, to for, I, I, I'm trapped in the way of using a copular verb to talk about that which is not. You just have to bear with me because we're using English here, and you're forced into that habit. But a nepa is not thinking nor knowledge. It is, depending on where it is situated, the issue of something that discovers itself to be absent to language and thought. And this, I'm hinging all of these larger claims on Winnicott's use of the word very, which I think takes his speculation on the unconscious meaning of blackness both beyond thought and or ontology. What I'm trying to get at with this phrase, nepa, in relationship, which is not a negation, is a kind of structure of a verb which involves a pre-predication, which has to be contrasted with both grammar and judgment. And again, I'm assuming that race, sex, sexuality are both always attempts at making meaning and judgment coincide. So what I'm saying is that that attempt is itself a disavowal, foreclosure, repression of something else, something more intolerable. So for me, the problem is to make clear what this pre, this pre-predicative logic is doing in analysis and what it means. And whether even psychoanalysis can grasp this pre-predicative function or structure of blackness in its own ideas of thought or thinking. I would say, I mean, this is again a tendentious, strong claim, that psychoanalysis perhaps has very little to say about the Nepal. But can it say more about blackness? I think this is why I find uh, Winnicott's essay so disturbing and a somewhat graphic illustration of why to use his own words, hatred as object relation makes it impossible to separate the most prized and idealized reparations from the most aggressive impulses and fantasies. For what repairs, since it articulates, thinks, and links, cannot posit or reflect on what it resists. It can only obliterate or envy it because of its own murderous idealization. And again, this is not simply restricted to white imagining of blackness, but also to black imaginings of blackness. We could say that if an object relation is equivalent to tolerance, precisely because it resides in doubt, in uncertainty, that is because it does nothing but affirm the intolerance that subsists as a real redoubt of its performative speech. And I would argue the same thing applies to sexuality too. Um, um, in this sense, we have something to talk about, um, perhaps in the Q&A. But for purposes of this short presentation, which I'm going to draw to an end very soon, um, the very thing that grounds the entire relation uh, between thought and being in this Winnicottian or in object relations theory turns out then to be a kind of racial unthought. And this thought, which is against both thought and our pleasures in thought against our pleasures in thought, is precisely a hatred which I think is absolute because it's 
primal. Um, so just to conclude, some the just to conclude, a couple more minutes. Um, this is my uh, kind of final axiom, um, which is that the the no thing, the the hyphenated no thing, is not a negation. And I think the key phrase here, if you read this when he got essay, on what he calls true mothering, as against mothering which um, is denied through recourse to contraception. Again, these are not my oppositions, these are Winnicott's oppositions. I think what he's saying in this essay is that true tolerance has nothing to do with the very black, or inversely, it has everything to do with the very black. Now, you could see true tolerance has nothing to do with the very black as a kind of odd echoing of what Freud calls, or psychoanalysis calls, negation. In other words, that what is said is not always what is meant. Precisely because what is meant cannot be said openly, but can only be said insofar as it's repudiated, avoided, or, and or suspended. Here, meaning is given, but it's abdicated, disowned. But more than this, for the varieties of negation, and again, negation does not take just one form. This is not. That's just the, the cliched form of negation. Negation can take many multiple, more complex forms. What I see in, again, a psychoanalytic account of negation is a, a kind of method of reading which tries to work out from an overtone what is being canceled, but always in the subdued form as an ambiguity of sense. And again, if you grasp what Freud is saying about negation, language itself cannot come to terms with what is being made, rendered as symbolically absent. Because precisely what is being negated is a non-reality that cannot be known as such. So again, you must, to think absence as absent, you should try and avoid too quickly trying to translate it into a sign or concept of absence. And I would apply the same kind of hesitation to how we or how I'm presenting blackness as a kind of nepa. Shouldn't move too quickly to render this into a sign or concept of negation. Accordingly, when we hear this, the dream of the most beautiful white object, has nothing to do with the Negro problem, i.e. the desire for the very black, what is it that we are actually hearing in these negations? And again, I'm just going to leave, throw this out to you um, as possibilities, two possibilities. In one light, these have-nots appear to be denials. In another, they also appear to be statements of belief. But what I'm also saying is that such expressions are no more true in themselves than they are statements of knowledge. For when we come across denial, we must understand that not all denials are somehow equivalent to a judgment of non-existence. In the same way, we should be weary of confusing what is hidden by being said for the function or pragmatics of saying it. I'm going to end there. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, David. Um, is this question already at the back? Um, where are the microphones? If you just give us a minute.
Um, thank you so much for that, Professor Marriott. I am still processing, but that was really so, so enriching for me. And yeah, so thank you for that talk. Thank you. It's really, really gorgeous. And I'm, I'm still thinking about it. Um, so I have a question about object relation as tolerance for Winnicott. Um, but first I'll summarize what I think you're saying and then you can tell me if this is not what you're saying because that would also help me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I hear you positing that something about blackness informs the very nature of how Winnicott defines object and object relation as tolerance. Um, and then also asking a question about how psychoanalysis is able to account for or not account for this kind of um, structuring absence in its own structure of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, so then my question is, because for Winnicott, what it means to go through subject formation has so much to do with testing, as in psychically trying to kill objects and tolerating either their survival or death psychically, how does object relation as tolerance relate to the tolerance of bearing that an object has survived psychically or not survived psychically? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I understand the question. Thank you for your question. Um, so the, uh, one of the uh, in, in, interesting uh, things to me about both Beyond's work, uh, and, and again, it's the, the work on thinking, the origin of thinking. They are thoughts which precede thinking and they are intolerable, is what precipitates the movement from, um, from these intolerable thoughts into the capacity for thought. And again, that's a way of containing, holding, tolerating that which is precisely unthought. So the two are in close relation. Now, um, again, if you think about um, absence, and in this case, it's the absence of the no mother. And again, we're not really talking about physical, literal mother, we're talking about the symbolic placement of the no mother in the emerging psyche of the child. And again, it's unconscious. These are all unconscious structures, diagrams, um, which are being mapped out at a kind of transcendental level, if you like, or abstract transcendental level. And it's what precipitates that movement, which is the question for me. And uh, in the theory itself, there's hatred, there's reparation, there's destructiveness, that's fine. But when um, Winnicott asks the question, what is the role of blackness in the unconscious? And he does ask that question directly in a paper uh, to, to unconscious functions of the word black. He doesn't do anything with it. He just talks about blackness as at the level of grammar, the symbolic object forms. But what I'm saying is that it has a meta-psychoanalytical meta role to play in the very formation of something which precedes negation. That's a strong claim. Um, does it make sense? I don't know, but that's my claim. Um, I'm not yet, uh, I haven't done the work on all of object relations, but you know, if, if you read, um, and again, this is uh, interesting to bring into this context, this debate, because even in Riviere, Joan Riviere, who's a Kleinian, Klein herself, whenever they evoke blackness, it always comes with a very overladen symbolic metaphoric structure, which is based on kind of intolerance. And uh, in, in, you see this take place in, in Rivier's work, both on, um, which invokes a kind of lynching scene in, in one of her papers, and in Klein's work, in Klein, it's about talking about the representations of negresses. Again, it, I mean, it seems to me that object relations has a story to tell about blackness, which has yet been, not yet been told, at a theoretical level. I'm not accusing Rivier, Klein, Winnicott, Bion, of being stupid racists. No, I mean, they're far more interesting than that. Um, but it is, you know, what their texts allow me to think, though, is the limits that blackness 
introduces into the language of psychoanalysis and the, the metapsychology of psychoanalysis. Um, yeah, here at the front. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, a further clarification point. Yes. So you were saying that object relations, according to your reading, are a kind of acting out or displacement of blackness, or acting out displacement of blackness. And I was wondering if that suggests that object relations, um, and so maybe less so of the object as much as the relation, are, if you were saying that they're associated with the repression of blackness, that the very relationality is itself a kind of repression within the self. Oh, or oh, non-relation. Non-relation. Yeah. Okay, so non-relation. Um, and I was wondering then the role of objectification, so mm -hmm. like Césaire or something. So does that, it seems to suggest then that the objectification is a kind of uh, indexing the doubt or mm -hmm. uh, pretending that the doubt has been excised in some way, that there's some sort of relief or release that comes from the objectification and so far as it's captured? Yeah, I mean, my point is a very simple one. The, uh, the, the doubt and the tolerances of doubt themselves fundamentally already rely on a fundamental intolerance and hatred. The doubt, the figure, the trope of doubt um, is already anchored to a fundamental intolerance. So it's really about the intolerance is a consequence of the intolerable. So to tolerate something and finding something tolerable are not the same things. Um, and again, this is what's bringing, I think what Brent, he says we need to tolerate uncertainty. We need to be able to live with uncertainty. Otherwise, we end up with what he calls a Negro problem which again, he's writing in the 1960s, he's writing you know, in the wake of civil rights, he's writing in the wake of you know, police murders, uh, demonstrations, I mean, there's, there's crisis here, um, and this is his response to it. But he's also seeing that crisis in a white woman's desire for the very black, and also her desire to be, to have the pill. The conflations are extraordinary. So, um, but here there's a story being told about something which precedes choice of sexual object, choice of racial object, sexuality itself. But it's not being spoken. It's uh, intimated. You can maybe read it in between the lines, I don't know, but I'm trying to do a reading of this text rather than simply reduce it to accusing it of objectification because I, I actually think it's much more interesting than that. Um, just one, sorry, Suzanne, one l quick question, because we're almost at time. So, yes, go. Let's wait. There's a pass at the back. Uh, Suzanne at the back, but, but we'll take this question here first. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go. Uh, very short, like, you um, spoke or said, uh, cogito, zoom, um, all this, um, and I heard uh, like a Cartesian uh, constellation in, in the back, in the back mm -hmm. of the, Mm -hmm. and revelation, and I, I don't know Winnicott very well, but I assume that uh, he is not, he doesn't have an interpretation of Descartes' cogito, and so I was interested in how you, so to speak, strategically um, aim at something in the Cartesian configuration with the... Yeah, and no, he does refer to Descartes. In fact, his, um, his account of a thought without a thinker, which is Beyond's formula, is actually a direct attempt to translate can cause a priori conditions of thinking into a psychoanalytic unconscious model. So he's borrowing from philosophy, including Descartes and Kant, or in order to talk about the origin of thinking, per se. But he obviously wants to talk about the origin of thinking in an unconscious, as an unconscious event, rather than simply a conscious, cognitive, representational, reflective uh, model. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, Suzanne, if you can hang on to your question, we'll take it in the Q&A at the end. Um, as a long-time fan of Klein and <laughs> the British schools, thank you. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah.
Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, our final speaker today is Joan Kopchak. Joan is a professor in the Department of Modern Culture and Media here at Brown. Her research specializes in cinema, psychoanalysis, feminism, philosophy, political theory, and architecture. Her work has been published widely in Differences in October, in History and Psychoanalysis, and in Angelaki. And she has held fellowships at the Society for the Humanities at Cornell, at the Institute for Advanced Study, Radcliffe at Harvard, and here in the Pembroke Center at Brown. She has written or edited a remarkable 11 books, um, including the very influential Read My Desire, Lacan Against the Historicists from 1994, and Imagine There's No Woman, Ethics and Sublimation in 2002. Her most recent work is focused on the cinema of Abbas Kiristami, the Iranian filmmaker, alongside medieval Islamic philosophy and psychoanalysis. This research will be published in her next book titled Cloud Between Paris and Tehran. Joan. Uh, yeah, so my paper is going to be, um, well, let me get to it. Okay, um, it's a bit of an outlier because it really, uh, it was um, a part of the project that you mentioned um, that will be out in however long it takes to get out. Um, okay, um, uh, the paper is about illegibility and sexual difference, um, but it approaches the topic from, um, um, a different perspective um, than presentations that preceded it. Oops. Is that okay? Okay. Um, but I think that's too. It's not okay. Uh, okay. It is. It is, however, not unrelated to my own earlier work, specifically. Um, Sex and the Euthanasia of Reason, where I tried to read Kant's antinomies in relation to the formulas of sexuation. Um, it is important to note that pleasure was, for Kant, a problem. The um, he tried to, at every turn to quarantine from thought, um, but it kept, uh, he kept running up against it. For, for Freud, it was a different story. Pleasure was for him not simply an element of psychic life, but a principle um, of, of uh, psychic life. Um, and it ruled over all cases. If the body was in Freud, a redu um, irreducible to matter, it is because the body is ero erogenous. Thus we could say, that the antinomies of reason read through a psychoanalytic lens demonstrate that um, it thought, it thought, if it thought, it thought misses the object, it is by failing to select the correctness of the negative, which would re reconcile it with thought. Freud saw this clearly, Kant set the stage for it. Okay, this is old hat. What I want to, ha um, what I have to say now um, is um, if you examine seminar 20, this uh, seminar on feminine sexuality, carefully, you will, um, you will not fail to miss strange references to angel being, being to the endlessly contemplated hadith there is no God but God, um, to the mythics whom Lacan says 
one can learn a lot about as he counts himself as one of them. Um, Lacan uh, protests in, in one of his seminars that he is not a nominalist, um, he is a realist, but he adds, but he adds to this um, he, that he, he was not a realist in the medieval sense. He, misp he misspeaks. He is a realist in the sense uh, that medieval Muslim mystics were. They, they are the ones who introduce the distinction between reality and the real. A quick definition um, of the real is an impasse in formalization or thought. The real is a kind of negation. There are, as we say, many, uh, there are, as we know, many forms of negation in psychoanalysis and in Kant as well. The real is a point at which knowledge falters, but it is not a question of non-being so much as a question of alterity. The real gives something to thought. This paper, I can finally say, comes out of that research um, into the philosophy of medieval Muslim mystics who were the first to articulate the concept of the real, its relationship to pleasure and to the body. They inverted, um, they inverted the standard notion of, of Gnosticism to what they called um, a new Gnosticism, different from the, the one that regards the body as what drags the subject down, renders it incapability of scaling the height of thought. Um, so uh, so I, I, my argument, this is why I, I, I connect it with a Lacanian theory. Um, and I've given several papers trying to establish this relationship of, of you know, of questions of agnosticism um, and the body and the real. And um, it's not pleasant because, because um, there's really no audience for all these three at once. And so I'm often feeling, um, I'm trying to make an audience every time I give a lecture. And, uh, but there are different people at each lecture. So they all leave with quizzical faces. So this is, um, this is a kind of a more a simple version of it. Uh, of, I don't get into the, Nitty gritty, I just can't do that again, but uh, it's a kind of an overview. Um, okay. Um, I, I named this paper um, a Cinema of Subtraction, um, and you should be thinking of the, of the term, the early cinema as the cinema of attraction, but I borrowed this term from uh, Kiarostami himself. Bread and Alley, which was made in 1970, um, uh, Kiarosami's first film was made under the auspices of Kanun, a cultural organization founded in 1955 <clears throat> by the wife of the Mohammad Reza Shah, later deposed by the Iranian Revolution. A short 10 minute black and white film um, it features a young boy who is obliged to negotiate his way his way past a menacing looking dog. The film is devoid of dialogue. It's only sound that of the extra diegetic Beatles song, Ubla Di Ubla Da, which accompanies the carefree pre-dog sighting stride of the boy, only to disappear and resume again after he manage, manages to deflect the canine threat. It is a sweet film, simple and straightforward on its surface, yet it bears a heavy burden, not only because Kiarostami referred to it as the mother of his films, um, not only for him, but for others as well. Um, it, um, it, it offers a new aesthetic, realistic in the sense that it presents an uncluttered vision of the world, mo modestly focused on a minor incident involving a protagonist solitary and single-minded, reliant solely on his own stubborn will and an ingenuity that permits him to overcome the challenges that confront him. 
In later films, the protagonists are not always young, nor in each case male, and often tend to be less irresistibly likable or capable of solving problems. Yet these exceptions do nothing to address the larger misconceptions embedded in the basic account. There is a considerable distance between Brett and Ali's intent and, um, uh, and the one attributed to it, that Kiarostami was a humanist or a realist in the ordinary sense, that he was indifferent to the plight of women, um, or turned his back on his own culture and countrymen by making films for export, that he failed to acknowledge, let alone confront stifling political circumstances that were choking the country, or take <clears throat> Iran's leaders and, and policies to task, as other filmmakers did, that these criticisms are unfounded, can only be refuted through a close reading of his films. One might begin with the acute observations made by Yusuf Ishapur in his still inexplicably untranslatable book on Kiarostami's cinema. In a single clipped but insightful passage, he puts his finger on a turning point in Kiarostami's filmmaking where others are inclined only to observe continuities which are also there. Ishapur identifies one consequential turn through a, a comparison of an early film, The Traveler, which was made in 1974, um, uh, with the later film, Where is the Friend's House, which was made in 1987 and really established uh, uh, an international uh, represent, uh, represent uh, 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 what is it? acknowledgement of Kiarostami's films. Both films were made by the director while he was uh, at Kanun. Um, they feature a resourceful and resolute young boy who will stop at nothing to accomplish his task. Each is set in an Iranian village with narrow winding streets littered with obstacles. Um, and in the um, Estimation of Ishapur, however, the two films are literally worlds apart. Here is how he describes the differences between them. In The Traveler, the earlier film, the places, um, the streets of the small village, the house, the school, serve as the setting of the story, while as in Where is the Friend's House, they become, through repetition, states. This is put in, in, uh, in quotes in, in Ishapur's uh, analysis, and this to indicate it's an Islamic uh, term, and it, it means uh, states are, are predicaments or conditions um, in which one is forced, um, uh, uh, one is faced by the unknown. In a state, one is faced with the unknown. Okay, so that's what happened in, in, in the later film, the, the Where is the Friend's House? The world is the, in, the, world is the site of an action here. Um, the action, uh, wait, I'll hit there. Okay, the world is the state of an action here. The action takes place in a world. This shift distinguishes Occidental mim mimesis from the Persian miniature. Um, and this is the distinction it make, that is made. The Occidental tradition is, is dominated by a man um, and his action, which determine the meaning of the world. However, in the Persian miniature, um, uh, the world is more important than man, in which his action and his drama are not determining where um, history is, and where history is of little importance, and where things, details, and their rhythmic um, ornamental organization manifest another dimension, which um, uh, Ishapur calls paradisical. 
The closely observed distinctions between the films suggest that Kiarostami adopts in the later work a refined vision of an oriental aesthetic. But we must be careful to understand Ishapur's observations without orientalizing what he means by the oriental. We must, in other words, guard against the um, cliched understanding of this other aesthetic. It has been noted, for example, that Kiarostami had a penchant for philosophical long shots in which the actors and their actions are visu visually diminished in scale as the camera pulls back to regard them from afar. These shots can be seen to invoke Persian miniatures. An average Orientalist meaning of these miniatures would con contrast an Occidental privileging of the individual with an Oriental absorption of individuals into a larger whole. Uh, the precipitous op th this precipitous opposition flits past without bothering to note the complications that deflect it. The distinction Ishapur makes, uh, makes is precise. It contrasts the world um, of the traveler, which serves as the setting of the story, um, with a world, um, the world, uh, with a world, that is, that is to say, an indeterminate world which appears where in where is the friend's house. Oh, it's the world, or uh, an, uh, a world. The second being um, indeterminate. In the first case, the, the world is closed, finite, and the human drama must thus either be contained within, a, uh, within it, that would be a historicist reading, or heroically, ruggedly alone, the hero faces off against it, uh, while the hero fought, faces off against it by transcending its limits, which would be the humanist reading. Kiarostami's films, which take place in an indeterminate world, conform to neither of these last uh, of these alternatives. While it would be not, it would not be incorrect to detect in where is the friend's house a kind of Persian miniature, miniaturization of the human drama um, as it unfolds, it is imperative that we understand this properly. Here is what the film is not asking us to believe. While young Ahmed may through persistence and cleverness manage to dodge various obstacles in order to save his schoolmate from censure by their teacher, his victories are small beer in, large, in the larger scheme of things. The Orientalist error resides in the assumption that the other dimension to which Ishapur refers in his description is a place from which human actions may be judged or measured as relatively trivial. Here is the pro problem with this interpretation. The world of the film, um, oh, as I emphasize, is indeterminate. It cannot be located at a measurable distance from the human drama, nor can it be regarded as a seat of judgment from which the individual can be viewed. True, Ishapur speaks of a world more important than man, but his argument makes no sense unless one takes him to mean more important than man conceived in isolation from this dimension. The salient point is not that the other dimension bears witness to the impotence of human action, which is incapable of intervening in the world in any significant way. The point is rather that this other indeterminate dimension, this outside, falls within man, buried, occulted there. Thus, uh, it thus fails to, um, it thus falls to man to disoccultate it, to make it known. The great advance of where is the friend's house? <laughs> I have to get that up. 
lies in the fact that it makes this indeterminate vastness of the world evident and in and through the young Ahmad. It is through his intervention that this indeterminate other world, which makes an appearance in the form of a windstorm, a turbulent breath in the penultimate scene, would remain completely cloaked in its native invisibility. Um, a simple praises of a traveler and where is the friend's house exposes the way their overt parallels are distorted by uh, formal um, divergences. In the, um, in the earlier film, Kasem sneaks out in the dead of night and heads to Tehran to attend a live soccer match. Although he finds his way to the stadium without any trouble, the arduous journey tires him. He falls asleep and thus misses the match. In the later film, Ahmed slips away from his village to look for a neighboring one in order to return a notebook to his friend who lives there. While he arrives at the destination where an elderly guide tells him he will find the house of the friend, Ahmed declines to knock at the door and deliver the notebook to its owner. These differences um, are far from slight. We are, for example, shown only Kasem's one-way journey from his village to the stadium, while Ahmed is shown crossing back and forth between his and the neighboring village twice, without any narrative motivation. The repetition opens within the, um, uh, uh, this repetition opens with um, an abstract temporality um, in the narrative time, um, a dimension of time that does not clock the progress of the narrative. The forward propulsion toward the goal slackens as events begin to uh, transpire less on the level of the narrative than somewhere else. It is as if another dimension had opened up, a surplus elsewhere created by uh, the repetition. The central action, uh, we can put it, um, uh, put action in quotes to uh, distinguish it from narrative actions of the film, ceases to belong to the order of narrative facts and opens some other fictive order. While the failure of Kasem, the earlier film, to fulfill his desire to see a live football match is explicable in terms provided by the narrative. The exhausting journey took a psychological toll on the young boy, for example, um, and, and he has a dream of being beaten up um, when he returns home, because, uh, which gives it a psychological alibi. The hesitation that prevents Ahmed from accomplishing his objective um, is given no psychological or physiological or any other kind of alibi. This is a st very strange in the film. Um, how then to understand the retreat of Ahmed from his thus far obsessively pursued goal? It is clear that the flat horizontal logic of narrative cause and effect loses much of, of its fascination um, as the other dimension um, emerges and uh, pr produced by the repetition. The act of friendship Ahmed wishes to perform cannot and will not be accomplished by returning the book acquired in error, nor will he fa come face to face with his friend on the threshold of the latter's door. If these solutions ru are ruled out by the film, it is because the accomplishment of the act does not depend on a simple reciprocity or the making good of a prior loss. But what strikes us as particularly uncommonly curious is the stubbornness of a negativity that seems to attach itself to the image of the house at which Ahmed arrives at not once, but twice, as if to mark this dwelling as twice wrong. 
That this is not the right house is clear, for we discover during the first arrival, along with Ahmed, that it belongs to another boy, one whose pants, visibly different from his friends, are hanging on the clothesline. The second arrival does not dispute um, through additional narrative or visual information the correctness of our former conclusion, and thus the, house, the house's unimpeached wrongness remains simply inexplicable, unless we conclude that this is not the house um, in, uh, in this second time is marked, or better, unmarked, in a more fundamental way. Everything seems to transpire as if, along with the forward thrust toward the goal, the image itself had lost steam, gone weak-kneed in the face of, the, of its didactic function. And yet, this is not it. What is astonishing about the scene is that it makes us, wit us witnesses of the image's failure to declare this is the friend's house. Film theorists will recall Christian Metz's, um, uh, Christian, uh, that Christian Metz, in an attempt to clarify the way cinema could be said to function as a language, insisted that individual images ought to be regarded not as words, but as statements. An image of a revolver, for example, should be taken as a declaration, this is a revolver. My point, and you, won't, you will detect the irony, is that this scene in particular, and Kiarostami's work generally, utters a retort, thus I refute Metz. For far from implying that the image fails in its task, that it is uh, weak or unreliable, the image in the films of Kiarostami refuse, refuse to bow down or make um, themselves subservient to reality. In brief, the primary aim of the image in his films is not denotative. Um, uh, and it is, not, it is not propelled by a didactic intention. Um, I borrow um, some of um, my description of, of what's going on in Kiarazami from uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's um, book uh, on, on, the, on, on his work, the, which is called The Evidence of Film, and where evidence is credited with a resist, uh, with a, where evidence is credited with resisting reduction to a documentary or finger-pointing enterprise um, or to um, a language or to a notion of language in the image as charged with the task of making themselves transparent to facts. Rather than pointing to objects existing in the world, evidence indicates or manifest and unseen. The strongest overall confirmation of, the central, of this central thesis can be found embedded um, in Kiarostami's frequently offered description of his film practice as an engagement with the art of subtraction. We create, the director said in an interview, not by adding, but by subtracting. The radical significance of, the, of this appellation is in, da in, in danger of getting lost in the fact that it is so obviously accurate that we think we know we we think we don't think we need to think any more anything further about it. In all of Kiarostami's films, narrative actions are pared down to the uh, to a bare minimum. Their motivation is short. Uh, their motivations are short in, in uh, supply, and conversations uh, riddled with silence. There are, in addition, all those unignorable holes in the ground, a plethora of sculpted underground spaces which periodically recur in his films. Up to this point, Kiarostami's attempt 
to wash out our eyes can be confused with the minimalist projects of modernism in general, which ha also had also become fed up with the piled up density of denotation. We must dig deeper if we want to understand the way subtraction relates to the strong definition of the image with which Kiarostami operates. Are you kidding me? It will, I suggest, <laughs> it will, yeah. <laughs> it will, I suggest, help to recall that the term with which Kiarostami character, characterizes his work reaches back to the pre-modern distinction made by Leonardo da Vinci between two contrasting ways of making art via addition, via de pore, or via subtraction, via de la le levera. The avenue of investigation leads us inevitab inevitably, in my estimation, to Freud, who evoked this distinction several times at the beginning of his career with um, the express purpose of aligning his new, um, newly minted psychoanalytic method with the latter term. In On Psychotherapy, for example, Freud borrows the distinction in order to set psychoanalysis apart from the technique of suggestion, which psychoanalysis was intent on displacing. Here's a quote from Freud. Paintings, um, painting, says Leonardo, works via dipore, for it ap applies a substance, particles of color, where there was nothing before, um, on a colorless canvas. Sculpture, however, proceeds via the le levera, since it takes away from the blo block of stone all that hides the surface of the statue contained in it. While the technique of suggestion aims at proceeding per, uh, per uh, diapore, it is not con concerned with the origin, strength, and meaning of the morbid symptoms, but superimposes something, suggestion, uh, in the expectation that it will be strong enough to restrain the patho pathogenic idea from coming to expression. Analytic therapy, on the other hand, does not seek to add anything new, but to take away something, to bring something out, and to this end concerns itself with the genesis of the morbid sy symptom which it seeks to remove. Now, Freud might have said this better later in his career, when, uh, but we can make out what he wants to say by, uh, through our uh, knowledge of what, how his theory ended up. While his approach to earlier methods of treatment may sound mild, while his reproach to the methods that he's, he's uh, you know, trying to surpass seem mild, he cuts to the quick, for he accuses them of covering up or concealing the unconscious. He says this almost in these, in these very words. Here's what he actually says. The suggestive technique conceals from us all insight into mental forces. It does not permit us to, for, uh, permit us, for example, to recognize the resistance to which the patient clings to his disease and thus even fights against his own recovery. If I insist on pointing out that he almost states his position, it is because he does not explicitly mention the unconscious and even appears to dodge it in his characterization of the via de pore as operating on a nothing before, that is, on a blank canvas. This depiction is, a, uh, is misleading, for from the perspective of the via de levera, the prior nothing is far from trivial, for it is not a mere nothing or benign, insofar it is the site of a resistance to recovery. The nothing at issue here is what Freud would name the unconscious. If the exposition of his argument is less than clear um, than it might have been, it is because Freud begins descriptively, thus seeming to lend credence to the 
proposition that these are two ways of making art, while he actually ends up invalidating the verse, the art of addition, as less than useless. The polemical argument places larger issues at stake, not only the means of obtaining therapeutic effects, but also inevitably sublimation, and as Lacan will make clear, uh, clearer still the function of the symbolic, uh, given the fact that therapeutic effects are procured through the latter. Rather, uh, okay, rather than pursue this world of, con uh, world of consequences, um, uh, uh, to psychoanalysis, I will make a few points. Wait, can I just do the, okay, I'm gonna hear it. Um, okay, one um, point stands out immediately. If the art of addition is an addition of covering up, the art of subtraction cannot be said to be an art of exposure. This is so, once again, because what is at issue is the unconscious, which cannot be exposed or dragged out of hiding. There's nothing to expose, since the unconscious is hidden is hiddenness itself, and thus not susceptible to unconcealment. The task to which the art of subtraction is called uh, must be therefore double. It must not only put an end to the obscurest agenda of covering up the unconscious, of a re recalcitrant wanting to know nothing about it, but must do so without exposing it, or to put it in, the, in positive terms that are required to do it justice. The art of subtraction is tasked with drawing attention to the subtraction that is the unconscious without sacrificing the subtraction, its hiddenness itself. We can say this in a fewer words if we simply adopt Nancy's term. The art of subtraction is the art of giving evidence of the subtraction, of um, giving evidence of what is not. So I was stop there, which is half the, what I was going to, but, but I, I, I bring this at a certain point, even in this paper, to a question of veiling of women um, and what that means uh, according to this logic and um, other things. And, and, and to the, uh, how the body emerges um, through this Gnostic uh, uh, tradition um, and how I think it really be in the relationship between the real and reality. But uh, read the book when it comes out. For <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Okay, do we have, we have um, just about five, six minutes of questions. So maybe one or two. Do you want to stay where you are, Joan? And we'll... So you come, come back to the microphone. Just for, just for a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, just for a minute. Um, and then we'll all sit down. Oh, okay, let me sit Can I ask you to talk a little bit about the long shot? The long shot. The long shot, which you're saying is pretty important in Kiristami. The long shot? The long shot. Oh, the uh, yeah, yeah, philosophical, yeah, at, at a distance, so yeah. Yeah, yeah the, yeah, the shot from a distance, where people look, um, what shall I say, like inconclusive, like they look, you know, can you say something about, I'm interested in the formalism of this, of the, the shot from a distance. Yes. Yeah. Can you say something about that in relation to the indeterminate world with which you opened? Like, is, there, is there a, can you just talk a little bit about the formalism of these shots that are at a distance and what they're doing in terms of indeterminacy or, or subtraction? The to talk about the the, the uh, yeah philosophical long shot in terms of no I'm talking about a formal long shot 
like in, in the film, that yes. we're seeing things from a distance. Yes. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that in relation to indeterminacy or to subtraction? Yeah. I mean, well, I think that this is the... Um, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, because I say, I think, the, uh, as I say, the um, Orientalist reading of the, this uh, Persian miniature, this, because this recreates a, a Persian miniature because the people are small, and then the landscape is large, and it seems like they're insignificant. But I'm just saying that um, if you read the, the films of, 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 of Karasami, the, the, the people are not small in that way. It's not that they're, uh, uh, it's about uh, some, uh, the, that the individual falls away. I mean, it's a, it's a discussion about the relationship of the individual to the, to the whole or the not whole. And I'm saying that that, that that indeterminate world, well, first of all, indeterminate means the world isn't closed. And then it isn't closed and there can be no then point of judgment, I mean, it, which, which the uh, Orientalist reason, uh, um, uh, Orientalist reading um, implies, you know, that they're looking, they're, there's no place to look down at the subject is small. Um, uh, and that this this vastness is 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 really the interior of the subject rather than exterior. Well, the yeah, the extimate, let's say it's extimate. That's how, how it plays out in 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 the, in the films. So that's helpful. Thank you. Um, little one, two, three. So we'll start over here. One, and then yeah, okay. Hello. I'm here. I, mean, um, I wanted to hear more about your understanding or reading of the last shot in the film of where's the friend's house. So it's where, where the, um, the homework book opens. We see that flower from the old man. Um, that seems to revert back to, or does that revert back to an art of, um, was it um, not revelation, or art of revealing rather than an art of subtraction? Could, could I, I, just, I was interested in how you interpret that scene based on your reading of um, the art of subtraction. Of, of that one scene? The final scene where we open the homework book and we see the flower from the old man. Which one are you talking about? Oh, sorry, but where's the friend's house? Oh, oh, in the book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk about the last scene in terms of the, about the uh, the art of subtraction. Yeah, because it, it seems to me it seems to go back to the art of unveiling um, to reveal something as opposed to an art of subtraction. Uh, I was, but I was wondering if if you read it that way or if you had a, a different interpretation of that final moment. Um, I, I I wouldn't connect it directly to the to the the question of of subtraction. I mean, it, it's not a re well, it doesn't reveal. M much it marks the it marks uh, the point uh, that there's something new has been well, the, the, he, the the what the boy has to do is not just to return um, it just doesn't have to return the the book that would just be it would be an absence and then it was plugged up by the return of the book and the fa face to face uh, you know handing it over the, oh the, the, so. The point about the dike, the dike the, uh, dimension being lost in there, where the this is not this is not the house. It's doubly marked as negative. It's it's twice marked as negative. It's not it's not by going. It, it again, it's not this external location, objective external location. Amek does have to just return the book, he has to do something. This, this esoteric dimension has to come into play rather than this external dimension. He has to do something. He can't just give a, a book back. It, that, that's what, you know, it also helps to define friendship. Hi, I have a, a hopefully simple question, which is, is subtraction the same thing as division or splitting? And if it's not, why, why subtraction instead? 
subtraction because something is 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 is, uh, is not there. You know, it, it something is, you know, it, it is. Uh, yeah, it's a subtraction. But what I what I what I argue is it's a, a, a it's a subtraction that instead of decreases the world. Or, or, or uh, is, is this kind of modernism that em empties out the world? It is. Um, it, it it fills the world. It fills the world. The subtraction fills the world. Fills the world, but with this it, this negative, this negative, which it introduces. It's not just things are gone. It introduces a negative, and that negative is a plus. It is a plus because it's an opportunity. It, it's the um, uh, well, what 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 Deleuze would call the virtual, I guess. Um, yeah. But it makes visible that it makes visible that there is something else, not what there is. Yeah. Um, what's the position of the law? Yes. Am I? Am I? Sp Elizabeth, am I supposed to ask a question? Okay. Um, so, thank you, Joan. I, can you tell me a little bit more about you? At some point, you mentioned the question of evidence. And, and I'm wondering what relationship there is, if any, between evidence and then this kind of logic of sub subtraction, which I think you were sort of partly just now answered, which is this, it's not a, well, if you can just say, how does uh, subtraction evidence itself? Um, well, okay. Uh, um, it, it, the, all right, the simplest way to say it, it I mean, it, it, it's, you know, like I could invent something, I can invent something, but I, you know, uh, Lacan has already given, or something already exists uh, that gives it away. Uh, so the art of sub subtraction make the, the, makes, think of the veil painted on the wall by Parisius that I'm saying that how does I'm, the, the question of how the image functions in Chiara Sandi's work, and the the, the veil functions not, uh, to give evidence that there's something else beyond on the other side of the veil. That's that's the basic meaning of it. That it that is evidence as opposed to. You know this dyadic function where you point to something that which is already existing. This this the image functions to indicate that there's something that doesn't exist, and that that that. Yeah, and there's also so so then I have you know long sections about the the modesty system in in Iran and the veiling and you know uh, the function of, of that and um, yeah the, so it, I I try to relate the the uh, function of the of the image in Kiarasami's work with the system of veiling and therefore. Um, take a, a different turn than I think a number of feminists have t took at the beginning towards uh, Chiara Sani's work. Okay. Thanks so much, John. Okay, we've got um, 25 minutes now. I'm just going to open up to Q&A and then we'll have um, a few bites to eat. I think the first thing, though, that I would like to do as you're gathering your questions is I want to throw back to the panellists whether you have any questions for each other. You don't have to have any, but... <laughs> I have a quick question yeah. for David about beyond. I have a quick question about beyond the O. Um, I always found his definition, Godhead, 
odd compared to everything else um, that he uses to define the O. But is that possibly there as a placeholder to hold the intolerable? This neo-enlightenment, sort of transcendental, yeah? Yes. Okay. And yeah, that makes sense now. That was just a yes. <laughs> you don't have anything more to say? Uh, well, I mean, she, Could, it was yeah. a very eloquent description of the zero or the, 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 the in Beyond's grid system. I mean, it's like a, it's kind of a, an O which stands for nothing, um, but it includes everything without necessarily symbolizing them or turning them into a phenomena. Did I see you No. Oh, <laughs> um, so I have a question I think you're all going to hate. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that and you can ignore it or rip it to pieces and then we'll, we'll open to the floor. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have anything to say about the question of affect. Um, because there's been a lot of talk about thinking and about cognition. Um, but there's also been talk about hate, um, which I think the relation of hate to thinking, I mean, it's obviously extremely interesting in Winnicott. So I don't know. Like, does anyone have anything to say about that in relation, um, Sally, in relation to the suffering body? It seems more a question of affect than a question of cognition. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts about that? Or I can just throw to the audience. Shall I say something much more pointed? I think the question of affect complicates a little bit our theories of thinking. Mm -hmm. to the panel. <laughs> Anyone or no one? I've already said something. So. <laughs> I mean, I think in a way it's competing with neurocognitive research in many ways. This turn to the body, but in a hyper um, biological way, as opposed to a turn away from it vis-a-vis -vis focus on affect instead of emotions or the psyche. So I think that's an interesting sort of parallel to look at both. No, I mean, I think we're all talking about things that are impossible to separate from affect, but from a Lacanian perspective, affect is to be distrusted except for anxiety. And the, the um, sorts of affects that we're comfortable with interpreting are often deceptive. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, I think that we can't separate affect from the problem of cognition, which is the sort of underlying, I think, imperative of your question, or to add it to the problem of cognition. I think in some way we've all been talking about the problem of affect, but I think the affect that in a certain sense all of us have been coming back to is the anxiety that is opened up by this confrontation with it, what we have variously talked about as, um, in David's terms, the pre-predicative or in Joan's terms, the indeterminate, or in Sally's terms, you know, the, the, the thing that leads us to ask the questions at all in the assumption that the question could somehow bring us to an answer. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that affect is, in a certain sense, what's motivating the entire tension between ontology, epistemology, and cognition. Okay, yes, 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 go. Yes. Um, where is Suzanne? She's gone. She's gone, so it's, you're, you, you've got the floor. I didn't even lose it here. Mm -mm. Okay. You're not. <laughs> All right, so this, this goes to Sally's um, wonderful comment about if a certain body of work didn't please the white academy, um, it wouldn't be happening. And so without um, 
referring specifically to your argument, I would like to cast that question in terms of the kinds of things we're talking today. We're talking about today. The kinds of things we were talking about today are not the kind of things that please the corporate academy that we live in now. And I, maybe in your schools, you talk this way all the time, but at Brown, we don't talk this way all the time. There's a lot of pleasing work being done. And I just wonder what we, you think about the future of the academy. Maybe we should just forget it, walk away. Can it be influenced? Is there such a thing as the academy without the kind of pleasure that is delivered so regularly? That's, I can. My answer is no. I, there's nothing to save. And this is coming from somebody who does not have tenure. I'm junior faculty. So I don't know if we're supposed to be speaking this way at my university or not, but um, I can't do this type of work and, and do fluff. Um, but it's not just white people don't like you. you there's a whole contingency, like um, a cartel of, gate, of black gatekeepers. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? Does that mean you're all totally optimistic about the future? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, no, no. No. Oh, no I, I think it means a number of things. I think that all of us are reticent to speak or to take the first step. So thank you, Sally. Um, but I also I think it's a it's a huge question and it's a complicated question because, as Sally suggests, there's the experiential position of the faculty member, untenured or adjunct or graduate student, or tenured. But then there's also the position of the graduate student of the students and the 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 failure that the academy is based on and that we are all responsible in our own ways for perpetuating, I mean, in all sorts of ways, graduate education at a moment when there are no jobs for graduate students, um, uh, pretending that most of our academies aren't really simply in the business of perpetuating power, um, pretending as, at least speaking for most of us, I think, as people in the humanities, that the humanities are more than uh, you know, a sort of loss leader for the academy, a way of, you know, giving students a sense that they're getting the patina of culture for their conversations while at the same time urging them to go into STEM or producing mat mat um, matrices of success that depend on how much money graduates are making five years after they get their BA degree. You know, we're all complicit with that, but at the same time, even in that situation, there are students whose lives are touched and changed by reading work by all of the people on this panel. And that's not nothing. I mean, how do you quantify that? How do you quantify the account of the person who finds in Sally's work or in Joan's work or in David's work a way of encountering the world that helps them to survive? Now, is that a defense of the academy? I don't know, maybe it's a defense of You'll forgive me, David, but of thinking, despite the fact that thinking is, you know, always in a certain sense, a defense against the intolerability of the thought that it's concealing. But one of the things that we negotiate is living in both of those registers at the same time. And the impossible structure we find ourselves in is having to, to be the thing we can't tolerate. Yeah, um, I have a question that's mostly for Professors Edelman and Marriott, um, but it's open. Um, I'm really interested in um, the idea that 
you uh, develop, uh, Professor Marriott, um, in Le Cas Noir about the real imaginary vis-a-vis -vis, um, Fanon. Um, and I guess I'm, in general, just wanting um, a better understanding of that. Um, uh, you write about how Fanon conceives this blackest X uh, or subject as a real fantasy in such a way that the real and fantasy um, are no longer opposed terms. Um, and um, that, uh, and then you're also citing Edelman in this, talking about the fantasy precisely of form as such. Um, and I think in relationship to your talk on um, object relations to, um, um, and you also talk about um, the um, blackness as a kind of symbol symbolic regression. Um, and so I guess what I'm asking is how you figure the relationship of anti of the the history and structure of anti-black violence to this real imaginary, and um, like, um, is it, and and how like the imaginary and the real get tied up in that and that figure. And then I was thinking about your work, Professor Edelman, because um, I was just thinking about if queerness as norm, non-normative sexuality, and that non like, that's an object um, that like has to be imagined. There's no there's nothing that uh, you know, we can't have sexualities that are just like inherently non-normative. That's like a social historical, um, um, like an imaginary, an imagined object is my understanding. And so I'm curious about how these two works relate. And then also like um, Marriott, your choice to go with um, blackness. And then Edelman, you're thinking about queerness. And there's a reason that that's your kind of chosen catechesis. So, yeah. Um, shall I go first? Yeah, that's a very technical question about the imaginary first and foremost and the uh, how Fanon reads early Lacan, which I think early Lacan actually is returned to in late Lacan in terms of this mm -hmm. topology, more to topological notion of the imaginary. Am I not talking in? Yeah, okay. Um, so in the Lacanian model of the imaginary, there is a moment of narcissistic triumph, which is matched by the unleashing of aggressivity. And what I think Fallon is saying is that that moment of narcissistic triumph is already laced with something more dissolute, threatening. Uh, so for Lacan, the imaginary restores the, what he calls the body in pieces. It gives it a kind of semblance, a wholeness. Whereas what Fanon is saying is actually the uh, moment of the imaginary is a further kind of experience of dissolution, which is then lived. And that's the moment where I would say real historical violence comes to acquire a kind of psychic imprint in the... Uh, development of the subject or subject formation. Um, because you're not simply seeing a mirror, you're simply seeing, you're also seeing overimposed on the mirror image how one is being mirrored always already by a kind of hateful image in the culture. So whereas Lacan, it's more ontological almost, but found on the kind of historicity kind of intrudes upon the ontology of that moment and imposes another kind of narrative on it. And I, I think Fanon is original in his reading of the real in that regard. It's not strictly Lacanian, but it has, he has different motivations for what he says, which I'm, I'm persuaded by. Um, I don't know what else, I can't remember what else you're asking. I think that may be you. I think I may have forgotten. What, what was the part that, was there a part that was addressed to me? Well, I was just <laughs> think, thinking about queerness as non-normative sexuality and that there's like historicity has to come in within an imagination of like a sexuality that could be non-normative um, um, and like Im immediately thinking about like no future and, and, and homo nationalism and um, the uh, queer assimilationism as like a um, uh, uh, proving quote unquote that uh, non-normative sexuality is not essentialized or fixed um, and then I was thinking if if that that seems to me a way that like history history of the imaginary is a history of absences perhaps um, as Marriott writes about like how um, mm, like the, the history comes it, it comes into and like structures of violence come into your figuring of um, 
uh, the people who are forced to embody um, non-being, as you write. So to give a short answer to a long question, I think I might, not a long question, but a large question. Um, I think I might say that on some level, one of the things that all of us are grappling with is what does it mean to choose a particular catechesis to name something that operates as the limit of language or intelligibility or outside or beyond that limit. In other words, every catechesis is going to emerge from a particular historical, cultural, and social situation. Some, all of them are also are going to emerge precisely within language. And as Sally was suggesting, you know, the catechesis as a figure is precisely in a certain sense the limit of language because it, it is an attempt to create linguistically a signifier for what has within the treasure trove of signifiers nothing attached to it. And so when we decide that we're going to speak of what can't be spoken and invariably metaphorize it in terms of what we experience in order to register what cannot be consciously experienced, the density of the metaphoric construction is always going to be overdetermined. So, you know, there's a really interesting book by Cord Whitaker called Black, The Black Metaphor. Um, and it's, it's about how the Middle Ages invent or, or, or solder actually a conceptualization of blackness that precedes the rendering of human subjects as black subjects onto those subjects through a metaphorics that translates into human experiential histories and, and doesn't necessarily translate in that moment, transhistorically or transculturally, but through the mechanisms that all of us have talked about, the Atlantic slave trade, colonialism, these discourses tr circumnavigate the globe and turn into ontologies. So what I think you're suggesting is that all of our ontologies are undergirded by such figures and the question I think that is perhaps motivating you is like why choose one figure rather than another? Why invest in one figure rather than another? And for me the important thing is not to necessarily privilege one figure over another but it's to recognize the figural logic within which we're trying to figure out what figure is inadequate for. Yeah. I, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I think it's sorry. me. Okay. Um, I have two questions, one for Professor Terefe and one for Professor Marriott. Um, for you, Professor Terefe, uh you wrote an amazing <laughs> uh, paper in the Critical Philosophy of Race called The Pornotrope of Decolonial Feminism. And so I'm going to actually read what I wrote so I don't mess up. Um, but I want you to speak a little bit more Personally, as a queer theorist who's practicing uh, psychoanalysis, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm sensing in, in psychoanalysis, in queer theory, in psychoanalytic feminism lately, an uptake in black feminist thought, particularly Spiller's, uh, an uptake in black critical thought. And in this essay, you speak a lot about how in decolonial feminism, black feminist thought is also taken up. but there are a lot of revisions made to it that that are actually um, repulsions, as you put it. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could speak to ways for psychoanalytic queer theory or psychoanalytic feminisms to not go down the route of decolonial feminism uh, and, and its pornotropic uh, approach or view of blackness and replicating that. I, I was wondering if you could speak any to that. Do you want to also put out the um, question for for? I, I can wait and. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Sorry. No, um, just quickly, decolonial theory and feminism is a creation of the academy as distinct from decolonial practices right, or anti-colonial practices. So the way to devise or think or have a queer psychoanalytic hermeneutic um, that avoids the anti-blackness of Lugones' particular um, decolonial feminism is do not corporatize thought. And secondly, um, she uses indigenous people's work without giving them the credit for the actual work they're doing to practice decoloniality. Um, what was the second part of your question, or that's it? Yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to um, maybe the uptake yeah. in, in psychoanalytic feminism of black feminist thought and, and black critical theory and whether, uh, how does it avoid its own, uh, its own kind of pornotropic uh, gazes that it might place onto blackness? Even if it doesn't engage with decolonial feminism, is there a kind of psychoanalytic feminism, psychoanalytic feminism that also replicates this kind of thing and how do we avoid that? I'll answer with a metaphor. Um, I'll perform my own catechesis. I remember when McDonald's used hip hop for the first time in their commercials. So the same thing that happens with black music and black culture happens to black thought. We do not control what becomes of our work after we put it out there. But if history in the past is a good predictor of the future, um, don't try and take ownership of any field of thought. Thank you. Uh, and my question for Professor Marriott, I, I was wondering if you could speak to um, what you term in the first part of Lacan Noir, it, oh, you call it a kind of the, the white universality of absence, um, or how absence becomes uh, universal and therefore white, and how that differs for you throughout your work um, with uh, sense without sense. You always talk about a, a kind of a black without sense. Is that a difference that you're kind of drawing from absence and the focus on absence? Are, are you trying to think about sense differently than the kind of usual way psychoanalytic theory thinks about absence? Well, um, yeah, I'm getting all the technical questions. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I think um, we may have an agreement or disagreement on this reading of absence. So, um, I mean, I did, it, I did ind indicate in the presentation that uh, the question of meaning and judgment are indissociable from you know, racialization, sexuation, common central versions of those things. But what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about in uh, Lacan Noir is um, you know, trying to read Lacan against the grain in which he's read, in order to incorporate the question of, of blackness into his text, which is not there. Unlike, uh, well, it is in kind of weirder sides, in the seminars and also in, in the published uh, work outside of the seminars. Um, so I'm trying to deconstruct, um, um, to use that word, invert commas, what, what he means. And I think um, blackness doesn't just force you into a questioning affect embodiment, the question of the topology or topographies, early topography, it also forces you to question what Lacan means by language, including signifier, signifier, syntagmatic, paradigmatic, all those that also figures tropes. Um, they have a very conventional meaning. You can look them up in any dictionary. But what I'm saying to you is that they are all, in the way in which they're being theorized, they carry a symptomatic weight or charge, which is underpinned by something else. And in Lacan's work, I think the, 
the trope which I find, or structure which I find throughout the works from the beginning to the end, is the question of mastery and also slavery. And that isn't just simply isolated to the margins of his work, it's central to key formulations throughout. So, again, the reason why I, I think the question of object is an important one, as is the question of choice, is that, you know, when do you want to, if you're trying to rethink, going back to your question to, to Sally, to, if you want to try fit, rethink gender sexuality away from the languages of sovereignty and possession, where do you go? And I, I, feel, I feel like in gender and sexuality studies, actually, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> so that's an impasse, going back to, I think you used that word, um, which I'm struggling with. I think we're all struggling with um, in trying to get it. Because I don't want to just make an identitarian claim against gender and sexuality studies. You're not talking about me. That's not what I'm about. I'm actually trying to rethink the very discourses of gender and sexuality uh, with another question in mind. Okay, it's time for us to um, break for the reception. Can I um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for your um, very engaged questions. I want to thank both Denise and Scott for managing questions from the floor. Um, Thank you to Elizabeth and others for the invitation to be here. And can I say, just to return to your question about the thinking that goes on in the institution, um, I think that the demand to think in a particular way produces, I think, a, a gorgeous paradox, which is Terefe, Kopchak, Marriott, and Edelman, and I'm very grateful for that. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for chairing. Thank you.